I'm a real deal. I'll shoot your liver out and hand it to you. Back to the morning shift. Here we are. Everybody awake? Absolutely. We're here. Wow, Demetrius, you sound peppy. You must have two monsters in already. <laughs> well, you know what they say is uh, is that the most important things are uh, passion and sincerity. And if you could fake that, then you got to made it. <laughs> that seems, seems yeah. legit. Pretty much, uh, according to my wife, if you can fake anything, you got it made. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I guess with that, we'll uh, just jump right into the podcast. We have um, a couple of announcements. We have a new Patreon this week, and I'm going to totally butcher this last name. Uh, so, Rob, you're going to help me with it. But I have Ali Srijan. Rob. Suriman. Suriman. Oh my God, we all suck at this, Demetrius. All these Syrian I thought it was Syrianin. No, Syrianin. Syrianin. Oh, Syrianin. Ali. Shout out to Ali. Yep. Shout out to Ali. <laughs> so, uh, th- thank you, Ali. And uh, if you guys would like to be a Patreon to the podcast as well, basically support the future content of the podcast. That can be done at Patreon forward slash Cue It Up. Uh, we do not have to spend any more time with that. Now we can uh, just basically jump into our shout outs. So. All you need to do is set it a contribution and a phonetic pronunciation of your last name, and you're good. <laughs> Second part optional. Uh, so, Demetrius, would you like to go first? Yeah. Yeah, you know what? This week I'd like to shout out to uh, Mr. Neil Stan, the Terminator. Uh, and there's something I want to share, and I'll tell you why I'm shouting out to him. Is I'm excited to share this with the listeners. He just launched the Terminator College which is specifically a mental game course, an online mental game course. So the website is terminator-college.com, and you can search for Neil Stan on Facebook or search for you know Neil Stan Terminator College. You'll, you'll find it. But uh, what he has done is put together – so his, his premise is that we all agree that the mental game is 80%, 90% of pool, and yet most people – neglect training it they don't know how to train it and 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 i've i 100 percent agree i think that you know you can watch other people play pool physically and we can sit there and copy bridges and stances and all this but you don't know how champions think view the table approach the table prepare for competition and i'm a big big believer in all this and so i am really excited so what he's done is during this downtime he, he's had this in his head for years and he's got sketches and notes of what he was thinking about doing and now that there was a break from tournaments he used this time to put this course together and actually to launch it. And so you could go and he's got a free goal setting course so that you can actually go in and take his goal setting course. Uh, and to get an idea of how the course, how his paid course would work, uh, you get a chance to kind of see how it works. And he's got some videos and some guided worksheets and guided, you know, workbooks and things like this. And then if you're interested, he's got a, a course that would then help prepare for batches. Like, uh, how do you analyze your batches afterwards? How do you, how do you plan and prepare for your matches? And then how do you manage yourself during actual matches? Uh, and so some different things like that. And I am excited and I think I'm going to be taking, going through this because I, feel that that's one of the strengths of my game is my preparation and my mental game. And, uh, however, I don't think that I have nothing to learn from a guy like Neil Stan. <laughs> so I'm very excited that he put this together. Definitely. Mike Howerton did a podcast with him and there's a lot of more information on there. So if you wanted to check out pool podcasts, uh, there is more information on that. Uh, Rob, did you want to go next? Why don't you go next, Nate? My shout out this week is going to be very short I am going to shout out to to Charlie Ray. Uh, Just know that we love you, man, and uh, you mean a lot to a lot of people. Uh, That's about all I have to say on that one. But uh, we'll move on. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to shout out to uh, Jeff and Wendy Shaleen uh, up in Superior, Wisconsin. Uh, They own the Top Hat Tavern up there. And uh, during this uh, pandemic, and they've been closed, of course. I'm thinking about opening now this 
Thursday, I think they have an opening uh, tournament scheduled for Thursday night with 16 players, I believe. And the news there is they have all brand new uh, seven-foot diamonds installed. I believe there's 10 of them. Uh, so they have a, a regulation size billiard table and 10 brand new diamonds to play on. So they're pretty excited about that. Uh, I think the, the standard fee up there is going to be, I think it's a buck a game to play. And then I, I believe it's an hourly rate also. So I shout out to, to you, Wendy and Jeff, uh, on, on your endeavor with the diamonds. Good luck there. Still haven't had an opportunity to get to Top Hat Tavern. It's a little bit of a drive for me, but uh, that is definitely a bucket lister I want to get to at some point in time. Heard good things. Yeah, well, you got you, you got the the Top Hat in Spirit, and then you go over to Lewis, you got the break room uh, with, with diamonds over there, uh, plus some nine-footers over there. Yeah, so for, a couple nice places to play. Yeah, for sure. Rob's yelling at me, so we're going to jump right <laughs> jump into in. the podcast. I love it. Jump right in. Come on, jump in. <laughs> I guess, Demetrius, take a bow. You nailed the score perfectly. 21-17 to 17 was your prediction. 21-18 was my prediction. And 21-20 was Rob's prediction. We all got the side right. We all predicted Joshua Filler to win the one-pocket matchup. What a match. <laughs> and I had, the, I had the luxury of being able to actually commentate this match with Alex Laley from basically halfway through day one and on. And I'm still... I ended up watching it back twice, uh, trying to just refine my commentating skills or lack thereof from some of the comments in the in the lobby. Can't make everyone happy. But I still don't know what I actually witnessed. I've never seen one pocket like that. I feel like I was like watching bonus ball when it was first on back in like 2010 or whatever it was when that uh, bonus ball tried to make a stint in the in the pool world. It's just kind of like it's a game that you know the the basics of, but you don't really know what's happening, and that's kind of what I felt watching this one pocket matchup. It was, it was wild. It was, it was crazy. It reminds me of you. You mentioned bonus ball. It reminds me of when poker. You know, uh, when poker first came out, people played a certain style, uh, and then as the money, you know, Chris Money Baker. Anyway, after the poker boom, uh, it gets to the game started getting more and more and more aggressive, and people started three bet bluffing and four bet bluffing and five bet bluffing, and people are just like playing these hyper aggressive styles based on game theory and all this stuff. And uh, you know, when Tom Dwan came along, and then and then players that came along that really understood, you know, how to play the game and the level of aggression. It was it was night and day. Whereas if you were playing in two thousand six, seven, eight, you know, people would be folding to your raises, and people, everybody just kind of waited for a hand. And then it got to where it was like there was just explosive fireworks all the time. And uh, and that's how one pocket seems to have changed too. You know. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, <laughs> it, it it was crazy entertaining. I mean, even people in the lobby were saying, "I hate one pocket. I can watch this all day long." Uh, I mean, it's. The, the what is it? Uh, the final score twenty one seventeen. So those thirty eight games of one pocket. And I think there was just over seven hours of play. I think there was about four hours with the day one, and I think there was about another three on day two, something like that. I think the yeah the games averaged less than it was like nine minutes a game, including player breaks. <laughs> That's like I've seen ten ball games slower than that, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was crazy, and you know every single it was either. You made the crazy shot and ran out, or you missed the crazy shot and the other person ran out. There was not a lot of missed balls. It's, I mean, along the, there was not a lot of missed balls once the player had the run out available. So once once you could potentially see eight balls or you know whatever you needed to get to your eight balls, there was not a lot of mistakes made. And I guess with players as as good as they played. And they actually, this isn't something that you normally talk about on a one pocket match, but they actually broke the balls kind of bad. There was several scratches. There was several times that uh, the cue ball did not get to the bottom rail. And that I think that kind of offered uh, maybe more favorable starting opportunities to both of the players. It wasn't it wasn't like they didn't break the balls good at all, but it just seems like over the course of a race to 10 or something like that, you'll see maybe two breaks over the course of that match that aren't quote unquote good. Uh, and this one, there was. It seemed like there was more, like four or five. Uh, so that also helped a little bit, I think, to to get the games more offensively driven from the beginning. But 
I could commentate something like that all day long. That was so much fun to do. It's so much fun to watch. Yeah, and I and I think that with the break going the way it did, uh, I will say this. You know, I, I did call it right, twenty one seventeen. Yeah, I'll take my bow. But I will say that there was a. I mean, I knew going in that it could go either way, and of course there was a ton of variance. And what I would say is a lot of that was due to the break. Uh, there was many breaks where Josh broke, where Tony was able to bank a ball and get running and, and in reverse. Uh, I don't remember the stats, but I, I it wouldn't surprise me. I'll just leave it at this. I wouldn't surprise me if the breaker did not win 50% of the games. And we saw this with a lot of streaks of five games in a row, four games in a row by one player. Uh, and so what that means is when you're seeing a game, a lot of one pocket matches, whether it's due to pocket size, conservative play, or more effective breaking and moving or style of play, we've seen matches where the breaker wins, the breaker wins, the breaker wins, the breaker wins. And then every five or six games, the non-breaker steals a game. And it's like a big accomplishment because it's like a two-game swing. This was the opposite. We saw huge swings and we saw lots of people putting racks together and momentum shifts. And that was probably because of a lot of reasons. But one reason also, in addition to style of play and all this, was because the, the breaks were just not all that effective. So when you see a score like 21-17, it doesn't mean nearly as a four-game difference means a lot less when you're seeing four and five-game strings than when you're seeing it where – everybody's winning off their break. And then that means that, you know, Josh, you know, eat down a couple extra games off his non-break. It's with the types of streaks we were seeing, this match was extremely close and definitely could have gone either way. Rob, did you want to jump in? You know, from what I watched, uh, I, I basically, uh, uh, the first day, of course, I, I forgot it was even going on. And uh, so I didn't watch anything. And the second day, uh, I I forgot again. And that was after a call from Nate reminding me and asking me how it went the first day. <laughs> and I had to tell him, well, I don't know, because I didn't watch. But I did watch a replay, <laughs> a few games on a replay. And, and what I saw going on on those few games I watched, uh, a couple of great players playing one pocket. It was kind of fun. And uh, I, I did see, though, some uh, – it was at a point, I believe, where it looked to me like Tony's game uh, started to lose some enthusiasm. Uh, that's uh, your personal drive uh, to uh, excel. Uh, it seemed that his uh, body expressions – uh, the way he was walking around the table, the way he was uh, reflecting after shots, uh, certain shots that he maybe didn't execute the way he wanted to. I'm thinking something like that wasn't quite the way he wanted to. So his, his body language was telling me that uh, he, he didn't, wasn't giving up, but just uh, didn't have that uh, adrenaline-dominating attitude at the table you're, you're right rob and i'll tell you part of that of course is when you're getting beat it's always yeah. hard to you know play good but there's something but there's something else too because a lot of people on the internet were talking about how uh you know tony wasn't you know, he didn't prepare for this match and he said it is a post-match interview he hasn't been playing much and all this and people were like well he was he was a little loose or he you know he didn't really prepare very hard but what i'll say about a guy like tony is you can't really have your cake and eat it too what makes Tony so dangerous is that he can play very nonchalantly and he can take high risk shots very, very comfortably. And one of his staples is that he, well, of course he plays aggressively, but he's also known for shooting in difficult shots and kind of coming with risky, high risk, difficult shots when the game is at stake and he's risking your balls all in front of his opponent's pocket and doing it without fear and without being tight and without being too hyped up. So when you see a player, you know, there's this balance between too tight and too loose. And what makes Tony so dangerous and so deadly is that he's real nonchalant, casual, laid back and kind of like almost to the point where it can seem disengaged or not caring. But yeah. I think that there's a very fine line between him being disengaged and defeated versus when he's at his absolute peak, which is, like kind of like no big deal. I'm just shooting one pocket. So I, I think he was he was playing pretty good, <laughs> even though he may have looked like that. I think his actual play was pretty. Strong. Yeah, it, it was more in his facial expressions of uh, not completely satisfied after he was done taking his turn. Uh, and the two games I, I did watch two games where he lost, and uh, it was just some mistakes he made. 
during the game, and they were minor. I thought they were minor when when he shot, but they weren't quite what he wanted. And and his facial reactions were uh, not satisfied. He just wasn't satisfied with it, and that showed up in his face. Yeah. What we talked about before is and, what what your show what you see somebody being is how they're feeling. And uh, it wasn't just his demeanor at the table, his overall relaxed uh, uh, type of play, style of play. That's not what I was talking about. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, because that is the way he plays, and that that's pretty that's pretty cool to maintain that. And and even though inside you're probably jumbled up a little bit, but I, I don't think he is inside either. But but I just saw I, I saw a little discouraged look on occasion. Mm-hmm. Uh, something, it's just a shot, you know, and, and I didn't see that when he was playing Compton, when I watched those, some of those games, uh, as much as I saw it against filler. Well, I, I think, and I think part of that, uh, that you saw, you said you saw the second day. I think there was a stretch in there where Start of the second yeah, day, yeah. there was a stretch in there where, uh, Josh was down actually 10 to seven. And then he gets up to eleven to ten to win the day for day one, and then he jumps out and wins the first, I think, three games of the second day. Right. So he had won basically what seven games straight at one point in time, and then mm-hmm. on top of it, at one point in time, I believe it was seventeen to eleven, maybe. I think it was seventeen to eleven. So Joshua Filler had basically won at that point in time ten games to his one, and. He wasn't losing these games because, you know, he was making mistakes. He was losing these games because Joshua Filler was just running out of everywhere. <laughs> right. Joshua Filler was making shots. Pretty good that, at pocketing balls. <laughs> yeah, he's making shots that, like, you just kind of scratch your head and you're like, why would you even attempt yeah. this in a game of one pocket? Oh, it went into the center of the cup. That's why you attempt these shots in a game of one pocket. So maybe that frustrated look that you saw on his face was not a f- face of, well, I hit this ball bad. It's more or less of, I hit this ball good, but I didn't hit it perfect. And I know that if I don't hit the shot perfect, Joshua Filler is going to use that that good shot that I just hit and turn it around on me and probably make a ball or, you know, put myself in a position again where I have to hit a perfect shot. Yeah. You're always playing back on your heels yeah. when you're playing and against somebody with as much firepower like he as Josh. Wasn't happy with with his performance. Yeah, I can I can name a bunch of times where Tony really played some good shots, some good one pocket shots. But good doesn't work against somebody with as much firepower as Joshua Filler. You got to play great or great. perfect. So I, I think that might be part of the front because I saw that too. And and actually, when it was seventeen to eleven, I, I'm making that score up, but I think that I think that's actually right because I think Tony ends up winning uh, six or five games straight to get it to uh, seventeen to sixteen, and then actually plays a pretty good shot, a pretty good safe shot. And flukes a ball into the side pocket. And I actually said live on commentary uh, at the time that you never want to point to one shot as being a reason why you lost a match. But that had that feeling at that time for me. Because Tony had just won five games straight. And he played a good safety shot. And then he basically just fluked the ball into the side pocket. Well, when you spotted that ball up on the side pocket, uh, it actually sure. wired a ball. So it it froze to a ball, or it was close enough to a ball that was wired to Josh's pocket. So if he doesn't make that ball in the side pocket, Josh really doesn't have a shot available to him, at least not a good one. And and Tony's got like a wall of balls. He's got like four or five balls available to his pocket, and Josh had none. So if that ball doesn't fall, Josh is looking at basically trying to do damage control at that point. But because it spots up, Joshua Filler is able to make that wired ball and then run out the rack from there. And that felt, yeah. in in real time, that felt like a turning point. And that that what I, that was what I had actually said uh, in live time on the commentary. And it turned out that that was the difference because uh, Tony ended up winning one yeah. more game from there. But uh, Josh ended up going on a four one run there for the for the win. Sure. Well, one thing I think is might be the the most interesting thing in terms of the. Uh, the actual overview of the match uh, is that Tony has traditionally always taken a certain role of being the underdog, the aggressor, the person that's fearless, and the person that's willing to, to, to push the envelope. But, you know, when he played Stennis and when he plays Alex and he plays, you know, uh, these guys that are considered the best of the world, he's, he's stepped up and done well at times because he's been kind of like, yeah, you may be better, you may shoot straighter. 
but I have nothing to lose and I'm fearless and I'm going to push the gas pedal to the floor to a level that you guys will, won't believe. And I'm going to do well with it. And his, and his aggression and fearlessness has been kind of his style and his, his trademark and his secret weapon. But now the, the role is reversed because Josh, here's he's playing a guy that has less one pocket experience well, maybe Tony Chohan might have even been the favorite on paper, and he's the wise, experienced, moving guy. And now he's played with a guy that is aggressive as Tony was. Josh knows that he can't outmove Tony, so he's got the gas pedal to the floor in a way that 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 we've never seen before, and he could back it up with shooting that we've never seen before. And so it, it was a really interesting mix as the kind of the role reversals that Tony was going through. Yeah, and I, I think uh, I think he was definitely. I think the line, most of what I saw for the line was uh, Tony minus three. So he was definitely going into this match. And I actually, I mean, there's always so many stupid people before a match like this. But I I saw a lot of people saying that Tony was going to be robbing. And I saw a lot of people that I would consider uh, smart bettors. Uh, there's a lot of people that just... They throw their money around like they have a printing press in their basement on these matches, and they're they're never on the right side of it. And maybe you know sometimes they are, but it's it's it kind of seems like they're just flipping a coin in the beginning, and that's the side that they're they're joining in on, and they're very vocal advocates that they're on the right side there. So there's a lot of people like that, and then there's a lot of people that I would consider good people who have really good gauges on the matches, uh, and even those people, I a lot of those people I saw was was taking Tony. This match was definitely a little bit tough, maybe, to gauge in the the general public of people. But I, I agree with you, Demetrius, that it did seem like this was. Uh, I mean, they even named the the match the David versus Goliath, right? <laughs> so, or even the promoters putting it on thought it was a little tilted towards Tony. Yeah, and, it, and the other thing that I thought was kind of neat, given that role reversal, is a lot of people after the match were saying that Tony made a mistake and that he should have played more conservatively. Because, uh, you know, Josh was determined, you know, to, to out aggression him and he was firing at the moon. And it seemed like when Tony got the balls on the table, he was out moving Josh and Josh would leak away enough opportunities that Tony could just wait for him. And the problem with that is that the problem with playing conservative in one pocket, I just want to answer these people that have, that have kind of been saying this, is that when you have balls in front of your pocket, you put a leash on what your opponent can do. And so they might have to pass on some long bank shots that are they're a slight underdog on when when they know that if they miss you can run eight and hell. Whereas if you don't have balls in front of your pocket and you pres- and you present no threat to them, they can start going for shots that are ten to one because there's no threat, and they can start moving balls in front of their pocket. And then little by little, you now have to try to clear balls out of their hole, and they and they can put they have free reign on the table where they can leave the cue ball anywhere, and so. The, one of the problems is if Tony had tried to play more conservatively, um, that might have just opened up the door for Josh to play, believe it or not, even more aggressively and, and, and present less threat. And when this when aggression has been his style um, his whole career, it's it was a hard spot because the other thing that was interesting about that is when you think about it, that's his, he's only ever had one gear. Tony's only ever had one gear. So for him, and we saw several racks where he did try to play conservatively, and then he wasn't able to make that work because – like I said, he wasn't presenting Josh any threats and left Josh free reign to start whacking balls in the hole. We've never even seen Tony ever even try to adjust styles. And to see him at a big money match for the first time in his life trying to figure out if he needs to mix it up, uh, we've just never seen that side of him before. And I just, I, it was interesting to see him wrestle with that for the first time. And I don't think that him playing more conservatively would have necessarily resulted in anything better for him. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, you could definitely tell. And I don't think it was a conscious decision being made by Joshua. I think it was just the way that he plays one pocket, where Josh was not letting him get an up table game. I mean, you can you can try all you want to get the the, the balls moving up table. If the other players banking one in and running seven from there, it it doesn't really do you any good to even try to do that. At some point in time, you're trying to do something. It's like you're trying to prolong the game while the other person's trying to end the game, and it's kind of hard to win a game of one pocket when you're constantly trying to prolong as opposed to you're trying to get yourself to a winning position when the other person's taking their winning position as it comes to them. It's a hard game of one pocket to win that way. 
when we were sitting in the commentary, Alex asked at one point in time, have we seen a, an uptable game yet? And I don't think we had. And that was when it was like 17 to 15 or something like that. So there really wasn't any uptable games throughout the course of this entire match. So, I mean, at some point in time, you'd think you'd have one. But if, if Josh isn't going to let it happen, Josh isn't going to let it happen. And, and it seems like he was prepared to say, I accept the fact that I will lose every up table game. So I'd rather lose firing at uh, firing at the moon when the balls are still in play and giving myself a chance rather than letting them all go up table where I don't have a chance. And so when people were talking, uh, I heard uh, Alex Laley talking about Tony, or uh, sorry, Filler should play the score. And there was times when Filler might have been up four balls to zero. And, and, and Alex was talking about how he should move the balls up table. And I'm like, I don't know. When he, it, there was like one or two games where the balls went up table, and uh, this was during uh, day one when when uh, Filler had like a five or a six to one or five to one lead, and then Tony won on a tear. There was a game when I think Josh was up seven balls to zero, and leaked it all away, and Tony came back and won. And after that, I was just like, yeah, I don't know that I don't know that Josh should move the balls up table, even when he's up five to one on ball count because he needs to keep doing the same thing that gave him the five to one ball count. This is not traditional one pocket. This is a very, very specific skill set against a very specific skill set. And you have to know how to adjust to optimize your winning chances. Definitely. I agree with that completely. Yep. Rob, anything you want to add? Well, a guy that, you know, pockets the ball best wins the game. Most pocket pool games are like that. Uh, not too many are different. That's- and and this is a, a pretty good example of, of a guy who puts the balls in the pockets better uh, than the other guy. It doesn't matter about the moves. And he stuck with that. That was his game plan. And and he, and he said, so I can't, how can I pocket the balls when they're all at the other end of the table? He, he just, he just well, I didn't want to go there with it. So he would take a shot. He'd take the bank shot before he'd knock the ball up the table. And I like that. In, in his one pocket uh, mindset, and one thing about that type of aggression is that that really can mess with Tony too. And I'm not saying it did. I mean, Tony's a great player, uh, but everybody else he's played against, you know, uh, whether it's whether it's Chip Compton or whether it's Alex Pagulian, they wouldn't shoot at some of the shots that Josh was shooting at. Right. And and what that does is it really changes your decision-making process at the table. In fact, something that Grady Matthews, uh, who is obviously, for those that don't know, he was a famous commentator and considered one of the top one-pocket players in the world and one of the most knowledgeable one-pocket players in the world. He recommended that at the beginning of a gambling session that you fire at some low-percentage shots because it, it, it keeps your opponent off your back. It's kind of like if there's a car tailgating you, you hit your brakes. Or like I said, in a poker game, uh, maybe you, uh, maybe somebody bets something big in an early hand, you might call and just try to bluff catch them and call with nothing just to kind of show people that you're not going to get pushed around. You might lose that pot, but you won't get bluffed again the rest of the night, Six, maybe. And so, early in the game. So what, yeah, so what, Josh, so, so what Grady Matthews used to say is when he gambled with somebody, he would shoot at some flyers early in the match just so that for the rest of the session, his opponent would be hesitant about leaving him certain types of shots. And another thing is, even if you don't shoot at him, one one bit of advice I have for one pocket players is look at him. So if your opponent bangs a ball near their hole and they leave you up on the end rail and they leave you some long sucker shot, maybe you're not going to shoot it. Maybe you know from the very moment that they leave it, you're never shooting that. Don't just ignore it and go ahead and look at taking their ball out. Go stare at the shot. Get down on the shot. Make it look like you're thinking about the shot. I'm not saying slow play people and drag the games out and all this stuff, but just send a message and maybe once in a while shoot at one. Send a message to your opponent that they can't just leave you up table and think that you're never going to shoot. Because when so when Josh was playing that aggressively, it really it really put a lot of heat on Tony as to what he could try to do, you know? Yeah, I think you saw the swings in some of those games went when uh, Tony was getting that style of game that suited his play versus the shot making style. Uh, got got back in it a little bit. Yeah, it was great, great playing. I mean, two great players <laughs> whacking it out, boy. That was fun. Yeah, one thing I'd like to say to your point about filler shooting so straight, and, uh, and I'll turn it. I'm curious what Nate thinks about this too. But I, you know, I've kind of thought about Shane's success. And what Shane did, I think, was he took a combination of gambling and match play 
and then like training, practicing, and tournament play. Like he was, he, and so like the Euros have been kind of been considered more like the tournament players or the practicers, at least through the 90s and uh, until Shane came around. Whereas like the Philippines and the U.S. players were kind of like the guys that were like backroom gamblers. Shane was kind of like the hybrid. He did both and he played and practiced more and he played more matches. He played more tournaments and he put in more hours and practiced. So he got a blend of both and he put in more hours. And it seems to me that Josh Filler is basically following that same path and even pushing it further. It's like this kid is always, I'm sorry, he's a, he's a grown man now. He's no longer a kid. This man is pushing, I mean, he's, he's in action in every game against everybody. He's playing every tournament, and he's putting in endless hours. I, I don't know that I've ever seen a player put in more into their pool game than Filler has the last you know number of years. What do you guys think? When I was his age, uh, not that I, I want to put myself in the same category as Joshua Filler, but I I couldn't play pool enough. I mean, I, I all I wanted to do was play pool. Uh, I wanted to get better. I wanted to practice. I wanted to basically play tournaments, gamble, anything that I could do to basically get onto the, the table and play. It, it, it'll be interesting to see what um, ten years from now what his game looks like based off of the insane talent. Uh, the hard work, the dedication, all of the stuff that he puts into his because he's already I think he's for my money he's the best player in the world right now, uh, and it'll be interesting to see in ten years what uh, in early twenties basically what he's willing to put into his game right now to make it even even crazy even better than what I thought was possible for somebody that's twenty two years old. Uh, it it'll be really interesting to see what happens in about 10 years from now with how, with how crazy talented he is. Cause he's, he's still what, what do you think? Maybe five, at least five, maybe 10 years away from his peak. If he continues this up, like you're saying, oh, that's, 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 that's amazing to think about. Like what, yeah, what could it look like? And what is this? Extra- and one thing that I want to clarify though, you're right. I was young once too, where I lived on a pool table, but the only difference between, and this might be because of, you know, I'm not going to explain the reasons why it's different, but what I'll say is there's a difference. There's a, there's two things. One is the volume you put in, but another one is the type of volume and the effectiveness of your volume. And so if, you know, for, for guys like me and you, if we're putting in tons and tons of hours playing against amateur players on bar tables or playing in local tournaments where guys don't consistently run out, we, we could put in the same number of hours as Josh and we're not going to have the same results. So Josh has put in not only the volume, but he's put in the volume against the best players of the world on the highest, the biggest stage of the world. And, and something about that. And, and there's a lot of people that, that don't do that because along the way, you, you know, um, well, of course for guys like me and you, and you know, most, most listeners, we don't have opportunity. That's, that's not necessarily the point, but why don't, why don't other players get in as much action as filler and, and stuff. And, and there's a few that do, but but what, the, what happens is you lose, you get beat a lot and you suffer a lot of losses and it's very painful and difficult and it makes you question yourself. And so, so what do you need to have to go through that amount of that many losses and invest in your game in the sense of investing in loss to the level that filler has? And he, the one thing that I think allows him to do it is that he doesn't seem to feel the losses. He just thrives on the wins. And he has a lot of belief in the long term and a lot of belief in his career arc and a lot of enthusiasm and belief in himself to where he seems more more able to laugh off the losses and just know that I don't care about that because in the end I'm going to be the best that's ever lived. And so that's a lot, that attitude has allowed him to not only put in the volume but also to put in the volume in areas that a lot of us would be scared off or hesitant or not wanting to go, you know, pain that we wouldn't want to have to suffer through along the way. Yeah, you can tell he's having fun, too. I mean, even in that, that one pocket. I mean, there was time he was smiling, playing, shooting balls in. I mean, he, he was having a good time. <laughs> it, it wasn't a lot of hard work for him. And, and when you're like that, when you're in that, when you're, when you're doing that and actually performing that, it is fun and it is easy. I watched a guy, uh, a pool player from central Wisconsin, uh, shoot a rack of nine, run a rack on a nine foot, uh, Brunswick with a broom handle, <laughs> the wooden end of a broom handle <laughs> and put the balls right in the center of the hole. <laughs> you know, I mean, so there's some talented, there's a lot of talented folks out there. And, and you're right about, you know, what the, the focus you need, the type of focus and stuff to, to get to that, to get to that level. 
and and then the opportunity. I think having a wife that is that involved in the sport that you love is kind of a big deal. She's not just a a player, but there there's your companion that's involved in totally involved in the game. That's that's got to be a motivating factor. Yeah, I, awesome. and I, I don't want to just brush over that either. Uh, I think that that is a huge impact on Joshua Filler's game. Uh, not only Pia Filler, that is, not only because uh, they have something to actually bond, and the things that they bond with are the things that make them so great. So their their idea of bonding probably is playing pool together. You know, it's one thing when you know you want a date night, and your date night involves you know going to a movie or going out to dinner and you know, doing something that's completely unrelated to pool. And I think that's not the case with these two. I think their date nights are literally playing more pool. And, it probably is. <laughs> and, you know, that is that is another thing that's going to make them just – I don't even want to brush over Pia because I think Pia is going to be – I think in a year from now, I think Pia is going to be challenging for the number one women's pool player in the world. And Well, look at the teacher. Well, not even the teacher as Joshua. I mean, they have the, some of the best uh, coaches back in Germany that they work with. I mean, they are working with the best of the best. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens with both of their games going forward. It'd be kind of like if you and I went over and took a boot camp with Demetrius. <laughs> well, it's it's no joke, you know. People, I was talking about it just now about how it's not enough to put in the you know you have to put in input, but you also have to put in the right kind of input. And, and so there's some players that just don't put in the right amount of work. But then there's other players that put in a lot of work year after year after year and nothing changes. And then they just feel like, well, I guess I wasn't dealt the talent card or it's just, I, you know, I wasn't, I, I just, God didn't smile on me. And it's like, no, no, there's guys that are 17 and 16 years old that have played far less hours than some of us have played that are, that are winning tournaments and running 200, 300 balls in straight pool. Uh, it's, it's not at some point, once you've put in more hours than those guys, then it's like, it's not about the ty- It's not about the number of hours so much as the effectiveness and the, and the aim of those hours. And I, and I really, really, really wish that people could see that more clearly. So how about this for a headline Demi, you got uh, Joshua filler breaks sets, new record runs a thousand balls straight pool. Joshua, you out there listening? <laughs> I'm planting a little seed. Yeah, not six twenty six, a thousand. You wow. think it's possible? Do I? Think I uh, no. I'll tell you. I I'm not play. sure. <laughs> I want to bet against Josh at anything. I've been I've been winning bets on Shane for over ten years now, and uh, looks like Shane is slowly going to fade away. And I'm I'm looking forward to having a a new horse to take his place. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm planning on riding filler out for the long run here. So if he if he says he can run a thousand balls in straight pool, then. Uh, then I'm I'm going to team up on his side. Yeah, yeah. I, I I from what I see right now in the next year or two, I think I think he should give it a shot. I I think that'd be really interesting to see it happen. Uh, so we can leave this discussion there as far as the Joshua Filler side. I do want to I do want to take a little bit of time and uh, highlight Tony Chohan as well because uh, I actually got to jump on and interview him afterwards after the event, immediately after the event. And he was so gracious and, you know, so he was so humble and it's hard to do that in the moment. Nonetheless, after you just lost a big set, but I mean, really, I want to give huge kudos to uh, Tony because he gained a fan out of me that day. I had never really talked to him or really had any experience around him, but he seems like a pretty genuine class act guy. And you know, kudos to him for being the big man, the bigger man there, and kind of coming on and talking about some of the the controversial things that had been said about him and the match itself. So that's that's a pretty cool thing. I want to I want to make sure that I, I give a highlight to him for that. Yeah, yeah. I almost gave I almost gave him a shout out. I'm sorry, I almost gave him my shout out both because of uh, because of what you said, which is it's really hard right after a loss, especially in a match where he could have won and maybe uh, maybe he passed on a few opportunities or if they ran it again, he might even be able to come out on top. So when you have a close match where you feel like you could have won uh, and you didn't play your best, it's hard to give credit to Josh, but also it's hard to get in the ring. And, and like I was saying, there's a lot of people that shy away from this. And these types of matches could not happen if it wasn't for players that had the heart and bravery and courage 
uh, to step up. And so not to say he's stepping up in terms of, uh, you know, odds, but just making it happen. So I'm, I'm really, really glad that this match, and this, this is the most amazing match I've ever seen. And it wouldn't have happened if Tony hadn't agreed to get in the ring with the, the straightest shooter I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Wanted to, I just wanted to make sure that we got that plug in there for Tony. Cause like I said, he really did gain a fan in me. He, he was great. So from there, we can uh, move on to our upcoming events. So there's not a, a bunch of events that, uh, of course, just like the normal quarantine that we've been under for the last few months. There's a lot of the things that happen are kind of spur of the moment. But there is one big match that we can talk about this week, and it is actually a fundraiser that I am going to be streaming as well. So this is basically being put on by TSBN, the Social Pool Network, and they are doing. Uh, they were trying to raise money for first responders and basically a bunch of different organizations that are that are out there in different states. So how this is working is there are going to be six players playing, and they are going to be from all over the the U.S. and they are going to be Rodney Morris, Johnny Archer, Raj Hundle. Tony Crosby, Tony Robles, and Oscar Dominguez. And this is going to be basically a, well, it's going to be Saratoga-styled nine ball. So for anybody who's not familiar with Saratoga, the game of Saratoga, you rack up uh, basically a nine ball rack. You have four stripes and four solids and then an eight ball in the middle. And then basically what it is is you break the balls and you have to run out in rotation either stripes or solids. So you're going to have four stripes and four solids in the rack plus the eight ball. And so you'd have the one, two, three, and four ball and the nine, 10, 11, and 12 ball. After you break the rack, you can start with either the one ball or the nine ball, but you have to then run that series of balls in order. And then once you make all of the stripes or solids, you just shoot the eight ball in and whoever makes the eight ball first wins. So it's it's a variation, kind of a, a merger between eight ball and nine ball. And it's going to be only between these six players, and they are going to be representing states. So Rodney Morris is representing Hawaii, Johnny Archer, Georgia, Raj, New York is uh, Tony Crosby, Florida, uh, Tony Robles, New York as well, and Oscar Dominguez, California. And the reason there are two New Yorks, pretty much the everyone would agree that New York was hit harder than any other state when it comes to the COVID-19. So they wanted to have that one represented twice. Plus, Tony Robles and, and Raj, they're, they're legends of that state. So uh, they are basically going to be doing a tournament over the course of three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, this coming Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's basically it there's not a lot of details we can talk about maybe the the format's a little goofy but maybe we can talk about who we think might win it or who the favorites would be but uh first off i guess let's let's hear your guys's um ideas on the event and the game itself great event i love it no, i'm really to call me up and remind me to watch it <laughs> <laughs> i'm really glad, i'm really excited to see uh some pro pool players that right now are uh are kind of in between tournaments and kind of have a income, you know, revenue stream shut off. And they're taking the time to put these things together to raise money for people that need it. And uh, for a good cause, I, I think that that's good. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really proud of these, these people for putting this together. And I'm glad that uh, you're going to be part of it. So um, as far as, and then tell me about the format. Like, I, I, I guess we don't know, but is it like, you have to make a ball? I'm assuming because they, are they playing, in their own basements like like we did during the queue it up cup or are they at a pool room or like are they playing each other or are they playing the ghost or how does that work yeah they're playing wherever they can and uh the the rocket run out is it's a game that was created by tspn basically to spurn some playing during the shutdown for people that do have access to their table so it's going to be the same exact format as that i believe and it's basically if you break and run without taking ball in hand you get a certain amount of points. I believe it's fifteen. I need to. I, I mean, I really need to bone up on these rules before I get started on, on this weekend. Obviously, but um, I haven't had the opportunity to play in any of those tournaments, so I'm not great with the rules. But I, you get a certain amount of points for breaking and running uh, without ball in hand. That's the most. And then if you decide that you break and want to take ball in hand, it's less points. But uh, you get points for every ball that you make, and then the the completion of the rackets you an additional bonus, of course. Uh, so you can either 
play it ghost style or you can play it god style. So god style is you don't take ball in hand. Ghost is where you take ball in hand. That's not a great answer. I Got know. it. <laughs> no, no. That it's you know at least it gets me in the right direction. I'll tell you what. I have a funny feeling, and, and this one I I haven't really seen a lot of these players play for years. Uh, so it's I don't have up to the date info on how they're hitting them. But I just have a sneaky suspicion that Roddy's going to play really well in this format. Something about you know I don't know if it's because this is his his game and uh or if it just fits his style as far as you know breaking well and then you know being able to kind of come with you know he's just just the right firepower and rhythm and and confidence and just creativity and you know i I don't know i just i kind of feel like rodney's gonna do real well in this thing well i think it's it's kind of a goofy format but cool i i've heard of games like that before and and yeah i i and i like the extra added uh, points for sure for running out without taking the cue ball in hand off the break you still got your pick you know you could take the four stripes or the four solids so you got some option there but uh, and with ball in hand then i'm thinking just making four balls and and the eight there's probably going to be pretty easy for most of these players but maybe not yeah for- we'll see yeah, I I mean, uh, it's definitely going to benefit whoever breaks and runs because that's going to be the biggest amount of points without taking ball in hand, I should say. Yeah. Uh, so it's definitely going yeah. to put a big emphasis on the break. But you, yeah, ha- you also have two balls that you can start out with. Easy. You know, it might be, okay, what do I do? Yeah. This is It's makeable, but maybe it's not in that 90% range. Maybe it's 70. Well. For sure. There you go. For sure. That's suspenseful, MC. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I, I think um, I, I kind of agree with you. Actually, I, my my pick was going to be uh, Rodney, and I still I think Rodney's probably going to find a way to sneak this one out. But uh, I am going to play, I guess, devil's advocate, and I'll take Oscar instead since you picked Rodney. I think Oscar has been – maybe he's been playing in his room. Maybe he hasn't, but uh, he at least has access to a pool table. So I, I'm going to hope that he's playing a little bit and he's going he's gonna to be playing well. Well, they're all great players. You can't really go wrong. And on top of that, you know, in this format, it's uh, it's definitely, you know, it's a different game, a different format. It's hard, it's hard to make any real confident predictions, but it's going to be fun for that very reason. Uh, and and so, uh, for those that want to support the event and uh, you know, both support these players and the cause that they are uh, pushing here. So, are you? I've seen you kind of post. Uh, your, what's tell me again? How what role you're going to have and how we can follow and support this. Yeah, so this is going to be uh, done at TSBN Cares. Uh, it is a Facebook group, uh, or it is a Facebook page, sorry. It is a Facebook page, and yeah, basically it's going to be a free stream from Facebook. I am going to be putting the stream on, basically it's going to be 12 hours a day this coming Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So it will be available all day long, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, which means that I'm going to be there the entire time, <laughs> which is exciting. Uh, I will be, I guess, uh, streaming it, and I will be doing the commentary for it. I'll probably jump in and out every now and then uh, for the most part. But, yeah, it's going to be streamed free at TSBN Cares. Now, if you want to support it, uh, 100% of the money goes to basically the winning players' state's first responders. So if, uh, let's say, Rodney wins, it goes to Hawaii. Or I shouldn't say 100% of it does. They're still finding ways to send some to the other, but the majority of the money is going to be going to the state that wins. Uh, If Tony Robles wins, uh, the money goes to New York. Oscar Dominguez goes to California. All that good stuff. But uh, if you do not want... So if you're from, let's say, Florida and you want it to go straight to Florida, you can actually toggle that as a donation thing. And it, it will go... That part will just go straight to Florida. But if you want it to go to the pool for the fun... Then there, but uh, there are a bunch of different ways to actually uh, donate. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to share the press release on my page. I had already done it once, but I'm going to do it again. Uh, and basically, that's going to be all the information that you need on how to donate or how to watch or anything else for the events. It basically has everything there. So, uh, and it also has all the people that are putting it on. So uh, myself and Ship the Cash, Mike is going to be doing the streams between the two of us and then uh jim uh jim dugan who's a who's a friend of mine from my area he's he's donated a bunch of his time to help out as well and he will be involved with it uh the promoters would be uh sneaky pete mafia and inside pool magazine 
And then uh, one of the big donators as far as uh, some content and is going to be Andy's Billiard Cloth. So so we're going to leave that discussion there. Uh, the more There's a lot more information on the press release that I will be sharing to the podcast page. And of course, uh, you can always reach out to TSPN Cares, uh, the Facebook page, or myself, and I can get you in touch with anybody if you want to make a donation or anything like that. Uh, but other than that, we can move on to the end of the podcast. All right, Rob, Moving I'm on. having a sad day. I need some jokes to cheer me up. Okay, okay. Now, these are, I have to uh, let you know, they're cannibal jokes. Okay? So are you ready for this? Rob, you're going to get me yes. in trouble. Can, you ever heard cannibal jokes before? Rob, you're going to get me in trouble. Okay, well, there's no cannibals going to call you up and sue you. Okay, here we go. Hey, you didn't have to give me the cold shoulder, said the cannibal who was late for dinner. Oh, Jesus, Rob. Okay. Uh, okay. Here's what. Two cannibals were eating a clown. One cannibal turned to the other and asked, doesn't this taste a little funny to you? This is the discussion that I wanted to have, and, it, and it's a discussion that Alex Laley and I kind of had on commentary, and I just want to bring you two into it. So Alex had basically said on, on air that the kind of shortstop to lower tier pros in the U.S., the kind of one pocket specialists, uh, players like Joey Gray and Chip Compton and Shane McMinn, Tony Chohan and Scott Frost, players like that. And of course, there's, there's a bunch of others that I'm leaving off there. But uh, that style of U.S. pro has always basically been able to have their way with European pros playing the game of one pocket. Uh, they can basically learn the game and get into a game with just about any European pro because they don't really know the game that well. And they're basically able to rob them, even though even though they're giving up a ton of weight and just raw talent on the table. They, they do know the game so well, and that makes up the difference. On stream, Alex and I kind of had a discussion like, is this the end of that? Meaning Joshua Filler learned one pocket, basically at Derby City this year. In fact, uh, he played, I, I believe he played Sky and actually had to ask rules to Sky as they played. So basically he learned the game three months ago and now he came to the U.S. and he beat the number one one pocket player that we really have to offer. Do you guys think that this is kind of the end of that generation where... Uh, the kind of shortstop to lower to middle tier pros in the U.S., the one pocket specialists, uh, are able to really beat up on Europe as far as the game. It, it, do you think that uh, this is a new era and European pros are going to be basically dominating the game of one pocket besides the Filipinos, of course, in the near future? Well, I, I actually talked about this briefly on our uh, last podcast uh, because we were talking about these guys, and I'd like to throw in, of course, not only Josh Roberts, but we left out Billy Thorpe, but we were talking about kind of high-end players that work uh, from the U.S. that play great one-pocket that were quite elite. And what I said is that I, I thought that as the, as the game of one-pocket became international, we were going to see a, a globalization the same way that we saw where U.S. and Philippines dominated nine ball in the 80s. Uh, U.S. in the 60s and 70s, Philippines and U.S. in the 80s and 90s, and then it became really worldwide. I think we're going to see the same thing with one pocket, and I think that as as the game becomes more and more international and more main, more mainstream, then uh, as long as that continues, then I don't see any reason why uh, the top European players are going to be able to dominate the semi-professional American players. Uh, I think it all hinges on whether the game remains a big enough game and it becomes global. But I just think given the draw of one pocket, I think that's the direction it's going. Yeah, I think so too. I, I think you see down the road here now, uh, maybe the European players will come in uh, and be part of the picture first. Uh, but eventually uh, the Asian players are, are, are going to, are going to step into the ring in this one pocket thing. And as good as they are in any of the other pocket games or non pocket games for that matter, uh, watch out in one pocket with these guys, especially with their, I don't know. They've seemed to got a little mental training, uh, the Asian players. 
Well, and I, and I also think that the striking edge has grown between, you know, between the shortstops and between the top elite pros. And that, that as, you know, people's fundamentals and mental game and just physically striking the ball, as that gap grows, it's also going to be harder for the U.S. players to keep up. Uh, and then it's just a question of, I mean, do you guys think that one pocket will become bigger internationally? Are we going to see more? I mean, will we ever see one pocket tournaments in a country other than the U.S.? That's the question. Yeah, I think so. I, I think we will, even in my lifetime. I think we will. You guys definitely will. No, I, I agree. In this, uh, I think, uh, and I just want to address one thing that you said earlier, Demetrius. Uh, you said Billy Thorpe, and I don't look at Billy Thorpe as being not elite in the U.S. Uh, that, so that's just the difference. And, and even Josh Roberts, to a point, I think Josh Roberts, while I do think he's a one pocket specialist, I, I think that he's one of those players that, uh, given the right gear, uh, that you know he can compete with just about anybody else in the world. Uh, not consistently, of course. He's not going to consistently beat somebody like Joshua Filler in a singles race to 11 or something like that. But I think he could where a lot of those other one-pocket specialists, I don't think that they have that gear in their game to be able to really beat a top-tier player. And I do think that uh, Billy definitely does and Josh Roberts does to a slightly less degree. And even somebody like Corey Duell, I, I don't put him in that one I was, I was just, as well. I was just going to yeah. say Corey Duell. I think that Josh Roberts, Billy Thorpe, and Corey Duell uh, are kind of examples of like, you know, they're street, yeah, you're right. They're not short stops by any stretch. And, uh, but yet they are, they are some of the best one pocket players in our country. Yes. Yeah, for sure. What do you think the future holds for, for, uh, Corey? I mean, he's, he's, been stable at where he's at for quite a few years. Wow. Well, I, I'll tell you, I'm a huge, huge fan of what Corey's done, and I'll just tell you why. He came along in 2000. He was playing great in the late 90s as a you know teenager yeah. uh, and, and bursting onto the scene. For those that don't know, he was the guy that solved the soft break and beat Nika right. 11-0. I think it was the finals of two, the 2000 U.S. Open. But what happened to Corey was something that would stop most players, which is the game evolved beyond him. And so he was kind of the main man or one of the top players through 2006. That's when Shane came on the scene, beat him in the race to 100, and kind of set, showed him that the game was starting to pass him by. And then he had this invasion from Europe with all these top players. And, and all of a sudden, uh, from 2010 to 2015, you know, Corey started fading from the conversation. Did he go quietly into the night? Did he just kind of run his same game and shrug and become kind of uh, a memory? No, he went back and said, what are these new school players doing? And he studied their fundamentals and he studied the differences in their patterns. And you see now, uh, if you look up video footage of him from 2018, 2019, his yeah. pre-shot routine, the way he steps into the shot, the way he cues, he went and played a bunch of snooker with the European players. Uh, uh, he rededicated himself to the game and said, okay. hey, I'm not going to just sit here and let the game pass me. Yeah. I'm going to learn from these guys. And he's been playing the best pool of his life. Whether or not that makes he's him win big events or not, he's been representing himself in a way that makes me really, really proud of him. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of see, you know, there's a lot of guys fading, you know, they're just kind of slip off. They're not on the Moscone team anymore, but he kind of still, he's still there. He's still part of that bunch and uh, battling. Yeah, I like that too. Yeah, for sure. But uh, yeah, so that was, I think, a, a pretty good little tangent I wanted to take there because I, I do consider Billy Thorpe uh, as being an elite player these days. I think I think the U.S. has... As far as elite, 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 I think the the player the U.S. offers four players that are elite at a international level, and I think it's Sky, Justin, Shane, and Billy. Uh, I don't think that Tyler's far away from that, but uh, Tyler has. It, it seems like the consistency hasn't quite been there yet, and I, I was hoping that the Kremlin Cup would really turn uh, his game over and really you know make him into that elite level player that I, I know he's going to be at some point in time, but. Uh, after that, he had a, a, a little bit of a, a lesser showing at the Moscow Indy Cup, especially after the dominating performance he had the year before. And we haven't seen him really win any other big events besides the Kremlin Cup. Uh, so I think that he's going to be elite if he's not there already. But I haven't seen enough of a resume yet that puts him at that category quite yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I know, but you're right. He will get there. It's two steps forward, one step back. Uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess other than that, uh, that kind of wraps up that discussion, I think. So we do not actually have a fan question this week. We did not get anybody uh, reaching out and uh, getting us one. So tisk, yeah, tisk, tisk to all the fans. Where we need, we need some fan questions. Come on. 
<laughs> so we can go back to our previous, which was the two tip segment. So, Rob, do you want me to take it away first? Okay, go ahead. All right, I will take it away first. Yeah. And my tip is going to be uh, I'm seeing a lot of people now that are coming back into the game. Uh, states are starting to open up. They might not be at full capacity of pool halls, but for the most part, if you're not able to get into a pool hall right now, you're maybe a week, maybe two. At most, you're probably three or four weeks away from being able to hit balls again. Uh, my tip is going to be do not fall back into the same habits that you did before uh, you really basically weren't able to play for a long time, especially if you use the break as a way of really breaking down your game and analyzing this. And this was uh, I met up with some friends this past Sunday and we watched uh, the the golf that was on and it was First off, it was nice seeing live sports again, but more or less, I was talking to my friend Jason Gibbs, and he has said that he is, while he has not been able to hit a ball since this all started, he has watched like hundreds and hundreds of hours of YouTube videos, basically watching the pros play and breaking down their games and trying to really look at self-analyze his game and break it down to where when he comes back, he's able to really progress his game, even though he hasn't been able to hit a ball for a long time. So my advice is going to be if you did if you use this hiatus as an opportunity to better your game like Jason did, do not fall back into the same habits you had before. It's going to be a struggle. You're going to play significantly worse than the last time that you remembered yourself playing. And that's not only because you are you haven't hit a ball in months. It's also because you're trying to change things in your game. Stick with it, give it its proper you know, runway to where, you know, you're just accept that you're not going to play your, your peak game for two to three months, maybe even as much as six months, but know that the preparation and the work that you did over this hiatus to really better your game is going to come to fruition. And you just have to get it to that point where you're comfortable and all of these things are second nature. Do not give up on it too soon. So that is going to be my tip. If you put the, the preparation in over this time, uh, give it its proper runway and give it its time to shine and really make your game better like you know that it will. Wow. I feel like I feel like shining right all over the place now. <laughs> oh, you stop it. <laughs> <laughs> that was really that was really neat. Well I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna kinda go a little abstract here and I'm I'm gonna take a little three cushion knowledge on the la of the last four years or five that I've been banging around with it and I kind of apply it to the pocket game. When I uh, hear uh, a player say things like, uh, God, every time I shoot that shot, I scratch the side. Or, and, and you hear things like that. And, and it may be true. It may be a, a shot that this, this player has shot a hundred times and every time he shoots it, he scratches it from the side. And when, when you start playing billiards, three cushion billiards, uh, what, what you see is uh, tracking of the cue ball. Uh, there are certain uh, track lines that the cue ball, it just, it likes to go to it. It takes uh, that that certain direction off the second rail. And what's pro probably happening in this player, they're cutting a ball in a side pocket, going two rails and scratching on the other side. And it doesn't matter if they hit bet between the second or third diamond, anywhere in there, they're still going to scratch in the side because that's a track. So I would study, uh, if I was learning how to play pool all over again from scratch, I would study those tracks. And simply, you never want to say, I scratched in the side again on that shot, because you don't have to. And uh, to understand that and look at it, uh, you really should go to a 10-foot three-cushion billiard table and find the tracks that balls, that balls go on. But I think... And this is going to be interesting. Now I'm going to thinking about getting into a nine foot bank tournament coming up on, on the big table. And just for kicks, I, I took regulation balls on my billiard table last night and I saw how many balls I could two rail bank and hit the fourth diamond, which would be the side pocket if I was going to put it in there. And I was pretty consistent on it. Uh, so I, I know by application uh, from my own experience, that this is possible to transfer these games from one to the other. 
uh, and and I also uh, in a, in the three cushion. If I pretend one of the corner pockets is actually there, and I'm shooting the first object ball into that corner pocket, I can predict now to within two or three inches anywhere in the playing field of the middle of the table after the third rail where that ball is going to go. Uh, and so I've taken my pocket pool training and applied it to three cushion billiards. Uh, and keep in mind that that the ball wants to track in certain lines on the table. Uh, so that's my tip. Uh, I, I like that. And one thing that uh, is great about three cushion and games, other types of pool games, nine ball, one pocket, uh, instead of playing like bar table, eight ball. But I think a lot of people have an idea of where the cue ball is going to go. But then the further the cue ball travels, the more blurry they get about where it's going to go to the point where it goes from being like, it's going to go on this line or it's going to hit the first rail right there. And then it's going to go up table somewhere in that direction. And then who knows after that? And I think the cool part about three cushion is that you're really paying attention to what the lines are after three, four five rails. Oh, and yeah. so you're, 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 you're just your visualization and accuracy uh, on these types of shots are a lot, a lot higher. And so, yeah, don't settle for just, being an area player, you know, start start watching exactly where that ball goes for sure. Oh, yeah. I think I, it's just your banking game. I, I can see if a person likes banks and they, they start training a little bit with the three-cushion billiards, their banking game is just going to get way better. <laughs> well, I know who I'm buying in the Calcutta on that nine-ball banks. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be right. just, banking balls on the side and I, making me cash. <laughs> because you can hit that because I'm so used to now hitting the third diamond, fourth diamond, fifth diamond, whatever, you know, after two rails to to get that ball to go to the short rail where I want it to hit. That it's surprising. You know, I don't have the pockets there, but I got the indentations of where the pockets were that I can see underneath the rail a little bit. So I know if I hit that dot, it's going in. Yeah, I know that playing playing nine ball, I play a lot of safeties, whether it's early in the rack or on the end games, where uh, when you're down to just the eight, nine, or just the nine, where there's a lot of safeties where you can play the nine ball multiple rails around to the head rail from spots that most people don't see. And oh, yeah, really? it's definitely, uh, it's amazing what's possible once you've uh, learned the shots and played them a few times. It, I can't imagine what it would do. I'm looking forward. I've just got a, a, a request from a fellow who's a pretty good player who wants me to play him some one pocket. And he's an up and coming player in the area and uh, on a nine foot. So I'm going to go down. I'm going to apply some of this three cushion to one pocket and see what happens. All right. Demetrius, take away your coach's corner. All right. This welcome to a coach's corner. Demetrius Gelatis here. And then pool boot camp. So yeah, I'll keep it short and sweet. I think I'm a little fired up this week and I'll just, I'll just cover uh, input equals output because we kind of talked about this and I, I mentioned this, um, a little bit ago about the different beliefs we can have. And this one might be one of the most important, which is it has to do with accountability. Accountability means you own your results. You own your pool game. You own your pool trajectory. It is because of you. It is because of your beliefs. It is because of your decisions and your actions. And in the end, it's a very, very, very simple equation. Input equals output. If you want to get out from your pool game, a certain level of performance, it just requires the input and to be fair, the right kind of input. And so if people, uh, if people are not putting in input and they're telling themselves that, well, it's just, you know, I'm just not gifted. It didn't come easy for me. I, I was taught the wrong ways to play or I have bad habits or, you know, whatever it's whatever stories people tell themselves, the, the actual, the reality is either you haven't put in the right amount of input or you haven't put in the right type of input. And, and so people, people have a hard time with this because uh, I think there's a few reasons people misunderstand this. One is people don't have any idea how many hours and how hard it actually is. You know, a pool's a tough game, and so everybody's put in a lot of work. I mean, everybody that loves pool enough to listen to a pool podcast has put in a lot of hours on the table. We're not all top professionals. So, so that's a combination of either – this road is a lot longer and harder than some people realize to get to the highest levels. And also it takes the right strategy. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're going, if you're going the wrong direction, then then going further won't get you there. And so, so it's some combination. So one thing is to be a little humble and yes, you've put in a lot of hours, you've put in a lot of work, 
but have you outworked me? Have you outworked Nate? Have you outworked Josh Filler? You know, I mean, it, it's not a matter. It's not just about you. It's a competition. You have to, you have to think about what you're putting in. You know, your opponents are practicing too, right? And so, and then, and I'm not telling you guys to lose balance in your life and quit your job and divorce your wife and, and, and just play 10 hours a day. I'm not talking about putting in input you can't afford to. But what I'm talking about is with the input, with the hours that you have to put in, are you, are you putting them in? Or are you, you know, frittering away hours that you could be putting in because you just don't believe it's meant to happen for you because it has, you know, hasn't come together yet or you're just not one of the people that it works for. It's like those types of beliefs will discourage you and then, and then you'll find yourself not even using the hours you have. So I'm saying you can do it, use the hours you have. And then as far as effectiveness too, it's like a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. And so if your weak link is, you know, whether it's a mental game or whether it's cue ball control or whether, whatever is your weak link that's holding your game back, you could sit there and put in tons and tons and tons of effort sharpening up parts of your game that are your strengths. But if you aren't addressing some of those weaknesses, then you're not going to see this huge movement. You're going to just kind of be stuck at the same level. And most players that I, I know are stuck at a level because, you know, it just happens. You get, you get good, it gets harder to improve, and you get stuck because you don't know where you're stuck and you don't know how to work on those things. And so, you know, some of it could be mental. Some of it could be, you know, or some of it could be your overall career management, which I've talked about, which is, you know, if you're not willing to take on loss and play tough players and get in tournaments and play money matches or do things that are, that are going to help you get better, you know, if you're if you're just going to keep practicing your basement, maybe you need more competition or if you are, you know, whatever. I don't know your game. I don't know what was missing from your game. But the bottom line is, if you can identify the weak link in your game and then put in effort in those areas, you will improve. It's a very, very simple equation. So if you are not improving then it's either you're not putting in a ton of effort or you're putting it into the wrong places. And usually it, it's like a negative spiral, right? You, you're putting in effort, but you're not putting it into the right places. Then you don't see a return on your effort. And the less return you see, the more the less motivated you are until pretty soon you're like, yeah, why am I bothering playing this game? I'm never going to get any better. And that's when people start to make these erroneous conclusions about how they just weren't given the right gifts. And what I would say is, no, <laughs> don't, don't buy into that. It's, it's, it's painful to have to look in the mirror and say, either I'm not working hard enough or I'm not working smart enough. But by owning that and being accountable, that's when you can actually make changes and get where you want to go. So it's like, it, yeah, it, it, it hurts to be accountable. Sometimes it hurts to acknowledge that you haven't done what you need to do, but it doesn't hurt as much as not learning how to really play this game that we all love. And so, yes, that is what I do at MN pool bootcamp. You can visit my website. I would like, I've gotten a lot of emails from people that haven't been to my website. And so I appreciate the emails, but please check it out, www.mnpoolbootcamp.com. You can see what, you know, testimonials uh, from people that kind of describe what three days with training with me is like, what type of stuff we do. But absolutely, that is what I do is I take people that want to get better, that haven't gotten better, figure out where the, leak part, where the weak parts of their game are, what some things they could do to strengthen those areas. And then we do it together so they see visible improvement before they go home and they have a plan of what to do over the next three, six months, and 12 months to continue on their pool journey. And if, that's, if that doesn't excite you, then you know, we're not the same breed because I'm, I'm, I'm all about getting the games to the next level. So input equals output. It's time to, uh, it's time to, to own it. You got to own it. Thanks, guys. For sure. That is uh that's well, well said for sure. Uh, Rob Demetrius, I guess that brings us to a close for another week. It's been a good okay, one. Okay, buddy. You guys rock. Good. I'll uh, check it out this weekend, Nate. So, uh, drink, uh, drink plenty of caffeinated beverages. I, I don't, ex I expect you to, you said you might be in and out. I expect the full 12 hours a day, no bathroom breaks, no nothing, no meal breaks. I want to see this old school. I want to see you just take this <laughs> thing home. Oh, buddy. <laughs> well, uh, I guess I'll dehydrate myself like crazy from now until then. And uh, I, I heard that if, if you don't have food for like a week, uh, the hunger eventually subsides and you stop feeling hungry. Uh, I think I've missed that window, unfortunately. But uh, I could try. I could try to just starve myself from now and then till then and see if the hunger subsides so I don't need to worry about it. By the, by the time Sunday rolls around, you'll be like, you know, it'll be like a spirit quest. You'll be like calling out shots. Well, uh, anyway. And I hope it goes good for you because I really, I hate to see you have to try to find a job. 
<laughs> Shut up, Rob. <laughs> yeah, support support small businesses in the U.S. Try to make sure that Nate doesn't have to get hired by one. <laughs> oh, you guys are assholes. <laughs> it's like, I, I like firing IGs because they're doing their job too good. <laughs> yeah, right. This is where we're at. I think the the podcast is done. All right, bye, fellows. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, hey guys, I'll have a good week. Talk to you soon.